Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Adam Levine, and we have the pleasure of having Garv on here for a special interview. Garv is one of the managing partners for TCS Attica Homes. He's also a partner for TCS Management Services and a partner at the Keller, one of the largest Keller Williams um, uh, franchise owners in the Philadelphia market. And just wanted to say thank you. And, uh, you know, uh, this is going to be an exciting, uh, you know, interview. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Adam. Okay. So now we, we have some, you know, we want to get to, get to know you a little bit more. And can you just like tell us a little bit more about your, your background and how you got started in this real estate uh, venture? Sure. I've uh, uh, been an immigrant to the country, came here in 1997, uh, went to Drexel, wanted to be the best uh, computer software programmer in the world, uh, graduated with a computer science degree in uh, December of 2001, right after 9-11, uh, lost my job. Uh, I was supposed to work with Unisys and had to pick a new career. Uh, that uh, made me look into different places. I ended up in a, in a smaller company that uh, happened to be in real estate. I learned a lot or uh, uh, hands-on experience when I was there. I was there for about six or seven years and I learned everything about real estate that I, that I knew at that point, uh, being in the commercial and industrial warehousing business that they had. I got my license. I was very entrepreneurial. I wanted to do something for myself. I started a small uh, brokerage company at that point in 2005. Uh, I got my license and then uh, uh, 2008, I started Mega Realty. Uh, that gave my, my foot in the door in the residential business. Uh, 2010, met my current business partner, Ben Oller. Uh, we uh, joined hands to uh, with con the condo shop in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, the condo shop was about six agents at that time. Uh, we are now close to about 60 agents in the team. Uh, as we were growing our organization, real estate realized that there are many more aspects of the business than just doing brokerage sales. So we started a property management company in 2014 called TCS Management. As we were doing our property management, we realized uh, there were a lot more investors who were looking for a very structured way of property management and not just a mom and pop shop helping, you know, with the front desk and opening mail and sending a check. So we were able to, we, our, our vision always was, how can we get to 5,000 units or 10,000 units? This is even before we really launched our TCS management company. Uh, and being having a computer science background, I always, I knew that I will never start a business where that much mail comes in and you're opening the envelopes and depositing checks. So I wanted to automate the process as much as I, as I could. So we got a great software. Um, we started building up a company. Uh, we started with a one big package initially. Uh, that led into more property management opportunities. Uh, we manage about 3,500 units today. Uh, and uh, in the last six years, it has, it has grown uh, exponentially. But while we were doing this third party property, property management, uh, there was a less supply available during the height of the market. Uh, when you can't find supply, how do you how do you go and sell to your investors? So we thought about, well, we'll create our own supply. To create your own supply, you find these shell opportunities and then you, you build the and rehab the properties and sell it to the investors. And while we were doing that for a while, we realized we're doing a lot more work and making money to all the investors around us. Uh, that's when TCS Sonica Homes came by, which is now uh, building our own portfolio. So that has been a journey from being a, getting into the business from computer science and uh, now we are into building our portfolios. Wow, that's, uh, that's an incredible journey. Um, that's an inspiration. Uh, wow. It's been a roller coaster ride, but what a great one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay, so now real estate. What makes you believe in real estate more than any other asset class? We have stocks, you have bonds, you have all different types of investments. Why, why real estate? So I fell into real estate, as I told you, uh, when I was looking for the, for the career, uh, that was the place where I, where I started learning something about uh, a career that I wanted to build. It was very fascinating to me. I loved it. Uh, I liked the idea of look and feel. Uh, I never got the opportunity to understand stocks. I, I think I would have been good at it as well. I'm a numbers guy. If I had the opportunity in, in school to go the financial route or be the investment banker route, uh, I think that would have been my second career of choice. Uh, but uh, I focused more on the real estate. But once you focus on something, then I didn't want to distract myself. 
into any of the fields, you have to understand the industry that you want to be successful in. You know, the, we, talk, we talk about the one thing, which I have a challenge now because I have too many things in real estate. Uh, but at that point, real estate was the one thing. So I thought it would be best to just focus every energy and every ounce of uh, energy I wanted to put into this, my career was be, would be real estate. And you know, there, there are advantages of real estate. Uh, you don't have to have a high school. I, I have a college degree, but I don't have to be a doctor to be getting into real estate. Uh, there's no limit of what you can make in real estate. Uh, you know, I heard somebody else in KWR, I once said, uh, he, he's the only high school dropout he knows who makes more than a million bucks in real estate. Well, that's a, that's a story everywhere, right? Uh, and then if you think about real estate, there's no, not many people who actually go to college to become a real estate professional. We all come from different backgrounds. So I like that human aspect. I'm a very so, uh, interactive person with people. I like uh, talking and interacting with people. I like the look and feel of uh, brick and mortar. You can go there, you can see it, you can touch it, you can take pride in it. You know, you can change it as per what you want to change it. Uh, so that, that fascinated me as well. And there's, uh, and there's numbers involved. It was uh, easy for me to understand it. So it, it, was, it was a personal passion. It was also the opportunities that I saw there. Uh, and uh, I didn't want to. Per- I didn't want to go anything different than real estate at that time. Uh, stay in one. To- stay in one field and try to excel in it. It makes a lot of sense. I read the book, The One Thing. Yeah. Great book. I know Daniel recommended it to me. And uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I agree with you 100. percent You gotta master your craft. You know, there's so many different things, but you just have to focus. And uh, you know, uh, my father always told me, stick to real estate, stay out of stocks. And, you know, it's uh, definitely a good lesson. People make a lot of money in, in uh, stocks as well. But if you don't understand it, you can lose a lot of money. And uh, I, I, didn't come from it. I didn't come from money where it was play money. Every dollar was very hard earned. So I didn't want to play with money. Uh, so I want, I, I'd rather have, I'm a very, I'm a very risk averse guy uh, for my personal investments and for things that around me, for my clients as well. Uh, I take a very conservative approach in everything. Uh, I tell them if you want to make, Overnight, if you want to get overnight rich, you know, real estate is probably not the one uh, for you. But uh, if you want to have a stabilized asset, which grows much better for long term growth, this is the best place. And I feel much more comfortable sleeping at night knowing that I have some stabilized assets. Uh, you know, uh, think about it this way in real estate. You could, you could you could not do anything for 30 years, but that mortgage will be paid off. It doesn't matter how the market is going to be that mortgage will get paid off. Somebody, as long as so your goal is just to make sure you maintain it and you have a tenant in it. But that's all I have to do. I don't have to worry about the stock going up, the stock going down, the market, the virus, you know, weather, uh, delivery, or, I don't have to worry about anything. I just have to make sure the AC is clean, the, the, you know, the, the tenant is there, and after 30 years, it's paid off. Somebody paid off $200,000 for me. Now the question comes in, how many times can I do that? It's such a simple logic. It just resonated with me and said, I can do that. I can do that again and again. Now the question is how many times? Well, that, that's the game. We'll figure it out. Yeah, that's uh, exactly. You keep on recycling the money, you know? The, so yeah, that's uh, really great. Uh, Tay, I know you have some questions. Oh uh, yeah, of course. So. I mean, the, I'm very impressed with the, your real estate journey, especially like with the non-real estate background. So that's really like uh, inspirational. So having gained uh, this uh, real estate related experience under your belt, so you formed a, J, a joint venture uh, like TCS Sonica Homes along with the Ben and uh, Daniel. So can you like kind of yeah, uh, share some your story of uh, forming this uh, uh, J, uh, JV uh, partnership and also uh, what's through your role in this uh, uh, journey? Sure, sure. So uh, uh, while we were trying to create this opportunities for ourselves and not just for third party, uh, we formed a company called TCS Investments. We had a couple of partners. We went through the cycle. We bought. We, we were doing it third party for for clients. We learned a lot of mistakes. We we. Uh, I realized what was happening, what was not happening. Uh, we, we, we're trying to carve a way around figuring out uh, the investment world uh, for, for the portfolios. And we primarily focus on single family. I think it was uh, our investors in the management company. They were comfortable putting uh, between $100,000 and $200,000 down. Everybody else was competing in the multifamily world. 
So it is easier for us mm -hmm. to focus on the single family. The returns on single family were much better. Um, and it was uh, easier to find those thousand dollars or twelve hundred dollar tenants uh, because of uh, uh, everybody needs a place to live. And we felt everybody's going to be able to afford a certain volume of rent that they need to do. So while we we're doing all those things for the other investors for thesis investments, and we took a pivot at one point, wanted to buy our own portfolios. Uh, Daniel is a is a husband uh, is a uh, uh, Andrea's husband. Andrea is a business partner in Black Label in our company. We got introduced to him as a family member. Uh, and he, uh, Daniel has a, uh, been an investor for almost about 20 years uh, with his father. He brings a tons of experience with him. And uh, Anika Equities was the company that he had. And he, uh, we, we were just talking and uh, my business partner, Ben, and uh, Daniel was spending some time discussing what a single family world looks like, what we had in mind. And he had the experience and he was looking to invest and couldn't find the multifamily assets as much. Uh, it wasn't as exciting. It, the growth, you know, it was a bigger, much more competition with everybody around. And, and he saw a good vision in the single family world as well that we were trying to bring together. So we found the right person that could be our partner in the world to have the right partnership where there's a, he, he understands the debt and equity world very well. We understand the management and the asset world very well. So we, when we came together, TCS Anika Homes was formed. So Anika, Anika Equities and TCS Management formed uh, TCS Anika Homes. Uh, and now we are, we are four funds into our projects. Uh, we raised a good amount of money. Uh, we have a good backing financially. Uh, we are financially very stabilized and continuing to acquire assets. We are under contract with multiple properties right now. Uh, and, and it seems to be doing wonderful uh, from our learning curve for the last two, three years that we went through. Yeah, that's actually uh, very interesting. Dado told me the same story, which is it's like to hear from someone else. Uh, See, I, we don't lie. It's a, the story of the story. It's the same story. <laughs> that's great. So what do you consider the most competitive edge of TCS relative to the competition, the market? I know there's other, there's, there's other competitors. There's a lot more competition coming. And why should investors invest with TCS? In the S in, in, in the SFR deals, um, why should they invest in private equity versus a REIT? And um, how confident are you with with the overall business strategy? Wow, there's a lot of questions at the same time. So I hope I remember them as I'm answering them. So let's answer one by one uh, and help me in, in in getting the questions again. So what is the most competitive advantage that we have in TCS on accounts? That's a simple answer. Our diversity in the marketplace has been a key factor to our success. Uh, we, uh, we have come a long way understanding the market. Uh, we didn't just jump into it to acquire properties to start managing them. Uh, think about if, if, uh, if an investor is looking to buy an asset, what is, what is the ultimate way of managing it? If he was managing it himself, he or she was managing himself themselves. So I would like to acquire a property. I'd like to make sure that it's managed the best way. I'd like to buy it at the cheapest price possible. I want to make sure I have the right team to renovate it the right way. I need to find out the best way to refinance it and I need to find the best way to, to continue repeating it. You know, the BRR model, you know, you buy, you renovate, you refinance and you repeat. So, you know, if you think of that model as an individual, I have to do it all by myself. Uh, so I have to find a team and manage the time doing it. So what, I, what, what Tisa Anika Holmes has been able to create is we had the brokerage division for years. We understand the brokerage market. Uh, we own one of the largest uh, residential brokerage companies in the city, KW Philadelphia. We have 500 plus agents uh, in the company uh, that we get access to a lot of deals that people share with each other. And we have internal off-market investment portfolios that we look at each other. So we are able to find some good investments. Uh, we have, uh, uh, Dan brings a great uh, experience from him from the back end, from the debt and equity ratio. So we, uh, from debt and equity side of the world, we have found that one of the best investment programs for us to be able to finance these kind of portfolios. Then your TCS management, which is probably one of the best uh, single family residential uh, management companies in the city of Philadelphia. And we have gone through iterations of finding out the best way of doing it. So we have the best management company to do it. We have the best package. And then you have your integrity and hard work and the hands-on experience. We all are very hands-on. I'm in the office, you know, Ben is working, Daniel is working. We don't take a hands-off approach. 
So your assets are being managed properly. We are every step of the way looking at it. You have you you an owner can duplicate themselves in our world, trying to find the same asset and get the same returns that they would if they were buying it themselves. So we feel that we are able to create that magnitude for them in the same realm that they would have been doing themselves. I think that's I think it's hard to find that kind of a package deal everywhere. You know, many many people who are doing investments would. They're contractors, they'll buy something and then they'll make money in the contracting world. But then they outsource the management, they outsource the leasing, they outsource the repairs. We are a one-stop shop. I think that's where, you know, if you have an issue, you call one person. It's, and, and we invest our own money into these properties as well. So, you know, you put, your, you put the skin in the game and, uh, you know, the investors like the idea of having people who believe in their own product. So that's a competitive advantage question. Um, you asked me, what was the other question you asked me? Sorry, I had a list of questions. So that, that was great. You know, one of the other uh, questions we had was um, why, and you did hit this before, like why SFR versus um, multifamily and why private equity versus investing in like a, a, a REIT, like a, a public sure. Okay, so I can answer that question. So uh, single family versus multifamily. The whole world was going behind multifamily. Nobody wanted to touch single family. And the reason why not to touch single family was very simple. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't very lucrative, uh, just looking at it. There was no, you wouldn't drive around uh, with an investor who says, look, I own that property. Uh, you know, they wanted to either, you know, multifamily is one roof. It's, it's, in the concept, it's easy to manage. It's one loan, it's one address, one parcel. So it seems like it's a, it's, it's a you know, it's a very, a relatively easier way to manage it, uh, not true. Uh, but single family was an unforgotten world, as for, was a forgotten world. So we saw an opportunity where nobody wanted to go, we wanted to go, uh, because it, that's where the opportunity really is. And we were really set up well on the management side. If you have the back end taken care of, then managing the single family wasn't an issue. So we were prepared better than anybody else to be in the single family. And, but you know, one of the major advantages that we feel in a single family world also is, uh, let's say there's something wrong with one roof. That doesn't mean that the other rents stop. Just because you, you know, there was an issue with the front door doesn't mean that the other 11 properties have the same issue. So I understand there's multiple roofs to manage, there are multiple locks to manage, but if you can automate this process and you have a better process running, which we have done fantastic in doing it with the right team behind it as well, we, we only lose rent from one unit for let's say it's called a thousand bucks we only lose rent for one thousand dollars if the roof leak not for 12 units for twelve thousand bucks so the risk has been minimized much much better in a single family and then the the opportunity to increase value in each home is much better as well so we we felt um i think investors coming in for with private investors if they want to invest a hundred thousand dollars if they want to invest uh you know, uh, not not really go down the route, route of putting all their money into one basket and getting a uh, financing the single family. If they got into a fund with us, then their their risk is minimized. So if we had twenty properties in a fund and one of them had a bad collection uh, had a collection issue, that doesn't really change the ROI as much. So you are also minimizing your risk with the other investors in the company to be able to not have two months of loss of rent that can really change the ROI in a single family home. So that I think was, was a very key component of a lot of people's comfort level. Uh, you know, if, if uh, you had two people not paying rent or if you had an issue with uh, maintenance or repairs or vacancy, whatever the issue reason, reason might be, it doesn't really. I thought I lost you for a second. Yeah, I had a phone call, sorry. And it wow. goes directly to the Bluetooth. No problem. No, that's actually a great point that um, I like the idea of a fund too, because you're diluting your risk and, you know, people are like, Oh, I want to invest in multifamily because uh, you know, you're, you have, you're dealing with the economies of scale, you have multiple units, but when you're buying portfolios of SFR or single family residential homes, you're diluting your risk. And I like the fact that you're vertically integrated because you do everything in house. You have management, you have the construction, you have the brokerage, which really helps you control all aspects of the business. And I see that as a, a really 
true uh, competitive advantage over competitors? There are not too many companies who can say that, uh, that they have uh, every vertical in the same organization. You know, our goal has always been a one-stop shop. I think that's where the real value comes in. If you, if you have the consumer experience in one place, then you control that experience in the future relationship. If you outsource things in between, then you're only as good as the third party, what they can do for you. So, you know, if you look at any of the larger organizations, you know, it's, it may not be fair to, for us to compare ourselves with the larger like Apple and Facebook and stuff like that. Uh, but just an analogy, they try to do everything in house development, uh, take an Apple store for sure. You know, they developed an Apple product and they have an Apple store to sell that product. And they have a service department in Apple, a genius bar to service the product. But the experience has been so amazing. It's very uniform. So that kind of a concept, if you include in, in our business, is the same way. If you have a problem with leasing, repair, maintenance, buying, equity, funding, partnership, K1 that you have to get, reporting that you have to get, you call one person and say, I have not received this. But if you do a good job in majority of them, the experience will be so smooth that you don't have to worry about, there's no blaming game. I can't say that person didn't send me the documents. I can't say that person did a bad job of repair. That person got us a financing. That person didn't do the leasing properly. Oh, we're gonna fire that company. We're gonna hire a different leasing company. It's all us. We take responsibility and we have the control over it. So I think that's a huge advantage. Um, and you know, uh, many people just didn't get into SFR, gave us the, advantage of getting it before many of the people. Uh, and I think the, ba the back-end package that we have as a cumulative group of companies that we bring to together uh, is, is just very, very um, unique in this environment. I agree with you. Um, I definitely see that as something, something special because a lot of uh, investors, they, they stay away from SFR because of the, the, the magnitude of what, what, what it takes to actually manage, you know, I know the goal is to, you want to own like tens of thousands of these and then open up a REIT, but how do you do that? You need to have the right, right structure to be able to put that together. Right, right. I agree with you. Okay, hey, what, I know you have some more yes. questions, really good questions. Oh, yeah, so I, I really like, uh, appreciate the, 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 the fully integrated structure in your business. So there, there must be many teams uh, like working alongside you. So can you like uh, talk a little bit about how your team is kind of incentivized and uh, how do you retain team members and uh, kind of uh, what's the, the retention rate of key team member? Because uh, I think the, uh, if the team is uh, comp compensated based on performance rather than transaction, I think the uh, like uh, interests of the all the team members are aligned with the uh, investor, I believe. So I just uh, curious about how this, your team is kind of in incentivized, yeah. Sure, uh, so we have about seven people in the TCS Anika homes, uh, but we also have about 40 people behind in the management and the support staff. So we have almost about 50 people working full-time salaried people helping us manage this, uh, uh, this company behind with the support system. Uh, but I, I think, uh, you know, there's a key component in, in any business. Uh, it's not just a compensation. It's a culture that you build. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've repeatedly said in, in, you know, in my career is I, I have never built any companies. I build teams and then the teams build the companies. I can't be in every place at any given, at every given time. So the, 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 we always over, you know, we always try to pay people fairly and sometimes over market, uh, good talent should be rewarded. Uh, there should be any cap on them to make as much money as they need to or they can. Uh, if you have the entrepreneurial transparent environment, uh, you take their feedback, you are, include them into your decision making, you learn from them. Uh, I think there's a sense of pride that people bring in for the success of a company and then they benefit in the back end as well. So you have to create formulas for them to be able to take advantage uh, of the time, they have, the time and energy and the, the thought process they've put in to a company so they can read the benefits just like it's as if it's their own company. So we, we, we do incentivize on these sales uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, every department is different. Uh, you know, some people are, are very heavy on uh, a pure salary with less bonus uh, and some people are very heavily bonus because of the nature of their role that they have to play. Uh, but you, you, you can't, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of companies who uh, sometimes feel it's okay to get somebody for as low of a price as you can, because 
uh, that is what's really helping with their bottom line. And if they want to leave after a certain period of time, it's okay because you replace it then with somebody else with the same amount of money again. But the yeah, but I think that's where they missed the mark. And um, uh, you got you got to be able to uh, to pay your your team members uh, what you what 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 you think they really deserve and not take advantage of you know any financial component to it. So uh, from our side, we we are never shy of paying our, our team members. Uh, I think they have helped us build the businesses uh, and you, you very heavily uh, incentivize them with bonuses on, on acquisitions. That's where the real money is. Uh, if the acquisitions are gonna be at the lowest price that you can find the market, in the market, that's where you really make the money. So why would you cut the hand that feeds you? You know, it's, it's in the brokerage world, I have the same thing that I tell to my clients all, all the time. You know, would you take less commission? I said, shouldn't you want to pay me 10%? You, like, do you want to pay me more? The, what the conversation should be that, how much more can I pay you to help me get more money? Your question always is, how much less can I pay you for you to make me more money? So that's the whole flaw in your mindset. You're cutting the hand that feeds you. You know, so in knowing that concept, we don't do the same mistake. I like that, the whole culture idea. I, 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 that's really good. I like that you, how can I pay you more so I can make more? Yes, that, that's an easy concept. You know, uh, why would you not? You know, why would you not? Why would you think if the more, the less I pay you, the better, more money I make? That's so short-lived. Then you're going to continue doing the same thing again and again. Our attrition rate is very low. Obviously, people do move uh, for other opportunities. But interestingly, in the last, I would say, six months, anybody who has moved out of our organization was not the cultural fit for us. Uh, it, it, either they screened, screened themselves out or we raised the bar so much that they, they could meet, meet the demand or meet the, meet the expectations, and then they screened themselves out. We don't really have to let go of many people. They just leave. And uh, it's very, very rare that we always have somebody who leaves and we look around and say, oh, that was the worst thing that happened to us. We always look as like, okay, that was an opportunity. They just screened themselves out. So it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, but everybody else stays. So, um, yeah, but you know, there's always analogy, uh, anomalies that happen. You know, somebody that you just couldn't keep or you wanted to keep but you couldn't keep. But I think those are exceptional cases. Uh, you know, most of the companies don't, in my mind, don't really perform well because the key people leave. And thank God we don't have that issue. How many employees do you currently? So in, in all our organizations combined, uh, we have close to about uh, 75 full-time employees and about 525 independent contractor agents. So yeah, there's going to be some turnover, but that, that's normal. That's the case. Uh, and yeah, that, in the, that's in, a part of business, yeah. That's correct. In the independent contractor business, I think the turnover is all, attrition rate is more higher. In the full-time uh, people, it comes down to more, uh, you know, more, uh, it's, it's a different concept. Uh, so, you know, but we are very, very fortunate uh, in our independent broker world as well. We don't have that much attrition. It always happens. Uh, you, you always hear agents leaving, coming in. You know, if, if we recruited uh, close to about 220 agents in the last 16 months, that means that somebody else lost that many agents. So then, you know, for us to recruit them, you know, there is always a gap in between that sometimes you have to try to fill to see what the agent wants. So uh, I, I don't want to go into a tangent for brokerage work. Let's get back into Anika Homes. Yeah, so there's there's market cycles, right? And what Daniel talks about was that he wanted to move towards workforce housing because he invested a lot of luxury product and he saw this as a way to protect investor capital. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about the ways you mitigate risk, you know, dealing with tenants, construction delays, and like what's the worst case scenario look like for this investment? And um, how do you prepare? Like how do you prepare ourselves to all possibilities, all scenarios? I know it's a lot of questions. Um, it's a load of questions, but you know. But I get your, po I get your point. I, I, I think the question that you're asking is, you know, how do you mitigate the risk and, uh, and keep all the unforeseen factors into play while still making sure that the investment is protected, right? Give or take. Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I came out of 2001 uh, cycle, as I tell you, my personal life, uh, you know, came out of uh, the 9-11 uh, downturn at that time. Uh, then we also saw the 2008, we saw the 2012, you know, we're seeing another turn right now that we are, you know, experiencing or at least 
uh, it is going through a, a pivot that we are trying to uh, manage at this point. You know, but uh, SFR, uh, people, people need a place to live. Uh, that's a fundamental you know, benefit that we have in this industry. People may not eat outside, people may not travel, people may not go to a movie, people may not buy expensive jewelry or what, you know, uh, fashion, you know, it's those things you can always live without a little bit because there's an alternate. You can't, you can't leave your home. So if everyone just stay someplace, the question comes out to be, how do you ride that cycle during the time when they're unable to pay or there's a challenge financially? So the only way that you can achieve that is if you don't over leverage. If you have enough equity built in, if you have enough, if you have enough oppor uh, opportunity within your acquisition, uh, and if you have enough uh, uh, buffer in it while you're going through a downturn cycle, then you can ride the cycle. It's, it, the cycle will always come back. It's a matter of how can you survive and how long can you ride the cycle. So that's where people who are over leveraged fall down. But if you're not over leveraged, you'll ride the cycle. Not everybody files for bankruptcy in a downturn or a recession or a depression. It's the ones that are over leveraged. So we, do, we, we always want to make sure our equity component is right. It comes from the right sources. It is not over leveraged by a fin refinance of a refinance of a refinance to use the money third level down. This is very focused, dedicated, hard on money. We put our own money into it ourselves. We have partners who are coming, bringing their money in. This is not, this is not their only savings of their lives. This is investment money. We, we, we screen our investors very carefully. We want to make sure that they can ride the cycle with us. We don't want somebody to come trigger uh, last minute and saying, I need my money back now because I can't survive. So you have to, you know, it's just not just where the money, it's not just the money coming from, it's where the money is coming from. Who are your partners? Uh, you know, if you don't pay attention to all those items, then yes, uh, you know, any market cycle, you're going to be really, you could really suffer. Uh, but we have, we have written the cycle very fine. You know, the brokerage company sees a difference, but uh, assets like this, uh, you know, we are, we are doing fine. So uh, I think it comes down to one simple fact. You know, are, how, how, how are you leveraged? And if you're over leveraged, you're going to feel the pinch. If you're not, there are opportunities out there at that moment. That, that brings up an important point is leverage. And, and another thing is you, you mentioned you got into this in the 90s, which um, that, that is a, a lot of experience. 2000. I was very young in the 90s. Oh, sorry. You got into 2000. I'm sorry, 2000. Yeah. So getting into the business in, in 2000, you know, you have, a, 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 you have your partners that have they've been around since the 90s. That's a lot of experience. So, so you, you have a, a really a, a, an idea of what happens in the market. You know that sure. level could, could really hurt your, yourself and other investors. And um, you, know, you want to really be responsible when it comes to taking on leverage. So that, that, that is very respectable. And Daniel is super smart. Uh, he's, he's extremely involved. He's in the office. He's meeting with the team members. He's going to the properties. He's looking at every uh, every penny for the debt, for the equ you know, equity that is being raised, uh, being making sure that they are being promised the right way. It, they are, we are not over promising, under delivering. We rather uh, under promise and over deliver for all our for our all our funds. Uh, and and he's extremely involved. And you know that's the kind of partner you want that has the experience, has gone through the cycles, has learned from the mistakes. This is not a rookie who's coming in and uh, you know, learning through the mistakes now. Ben is a second or third generation into real estate. He's lived real estate all his life. I'm the rookie here. I'm the one that, uh, more than them, that uh, is learning as we're going along. But you know, I, I have, I'm a very operational, hands-on, uh, uh, very focused micromanager. Uh, I, I like the details. I want to make sure uh, you know, every dot's uh, yeah, you know, are checked, everything is uh, up to date. Uh, I read everything. Uh, more than I should, but I spend, you know, so there's, we all bring different values. Uh, it comes down to a team, right? You know, look, look at Tay and yourself. You know, you decided to join hands for a reason. Anybody who has a business outside has found a missing key component, uh, and we call it a missing people uh, uh, values uh, or missing person evaluation of what am I missing in me that I need to find outside to become the best opportunity in this that the world has seen. So me and Ben were together and then we found out that there was a missing component and Daniel filled the role. And Daniel found mm -hmm. that he was, he had a missing person 
who didn't have the experience like we both do. So, you know, the, the talent, the experience, the knowledge, the relationship, the culture, the, you know, that came, once it comes together, uh, and, and, and Danny is not our first partner in this venture. He's probably our first, second, third. He's a fourth partner. But the first three didn't work out because um, we thought uh, it may work out and it didn't. And uh, we amicably still friends with each one of them. Uh, I appreciate them a lot. They taught us a lot. They helped us through the cycle. But it wasn't the vision to take it to the next level. And they were missing some key components that Daniel brings to the table. Or we didn't have all the stuff that they needed for us to be beneficial. And then Daniel was there. So, the, the, you know, uh, the four times a charm, I guess. Uh, but uh, we're very proud and honored and fortunate to be in business with Daniel. Yeah, it actually, right. that brings up a good point is uh, partnerships. That's why I reached out to Daniel. Small world. Uh, you know, I've known him for i think five time for like five years um he reached he invested with some developers my family invested with and you know i i reached out to him he told me about this new business plan and i was like whoa this is amazing and basically i was looking for a partner at that time because i have a master's degree from drexel we're both alumni from drexel university but the one thing i was missing was the the experience 35 years old. I don't, I, I've never been through a, a cycle. Um, and so that's why I was like, okay, well, can, can you, can I invest with you? Can I create a platform where I could learn with you and have investors run with us? And I know you have a, a larger minimal investment, but I want to bring it down to the masses where investors could invest a smaller minimal investment and then also learn. And we're not talking about just learning from, anybody we're talking about learning with a institutional quality operator meaning that you're vertically integrated you have the infrastructure in place and that you know data was talking about some institutional capital partners sure. you want to you want, you want to bring on board eventually to take you days that's correct yeah. so we so we have we have that vision uh, our goal is to win multiple markets we have the you know track record is extremely important for you to go big, you have to prove a concept, like any franchise as well. We don't think of any franchise, but the uh, analogy is you got to prove concept once. And if that's taken care of, you can duplicate and replicate again and again. But you got to make sure that it works very well here. Uh, and then there are the growing pains that you may experience. So I think that's what we're doing here. Uh, but now we are starting to dabble a little bit outside. Uh, we have the right uh, processes in place. We understand what works and doesn't work. Uh, we, we are very successful in what we're doing now. We are giving our investors uh, better returns than we promised. Uh, we are continuing on the path of whatever we promised we are achieving it. Um, in the last four or five months, didn't didn't change anything. Uh, we were able to keep on track. Actually, it expedited our track for uh, the opportunities that we are finding right now. Uh, we are able to buy, our, our buying cost has gone down now than it has in the past. So the returns are gonna be actually be even better. Uh, for what we promised to our investors. Uh, and uh, we, we have some great institutional money coming behind us at this point. Uh, they are seeing what we are doing. Um, they, they, they like our, uh, our complete uh, group of companies as one big package where they feel, uh, you know, this is the umbrella that is, uh, is worthy of, of continuing to do what we are doing today. It's not a, you know, a buy and flip and rehab and flip one off here and there. You know, this is long-term sustaining models. So uh, I think they're also realizing it as they're pivoting away from multifamily, the competition has increased so much uh, and the competition is increasing in SFR here now as well uh, because it has been, you know, many reports have been out there. A lot of studies have been done on that. A lot of institutions are looking to invest money into it. You know, but I think we are, we are, uh, we are ahead of the game. Uh, we have the uh, beginner's advantage a little bit. Uh, we have done it for the last two, three years and others will have to catch up. And it's building the one-stop shop is, not an easy thing to do um, overnight. So we think we'll continue having that advantage and we'll pass on to, the, to our investors as well. That's very interesting um, talking about that. Uh, there's, there, you know, there's other institutional investors looking to get in, but you have, but you, you have a head start. And you know, that, that to me is you know, something that's very important. And also, I know there's some other private equity firms that you actually manage properties for which is very interesting as well so so we do have other sfr investors that uh you know that uh, are have gotten the uh, 
uh, confidence of starting to invest into further opportunities because they know that the back end is taken care of. Uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, doing the right thing every single time. That's what integrity is called. So you, you manage other people's assets and helping them grow. There's enough opportunities for us to grow as well. So we don't compete with them. We complement their efforts and uh, we have a, a model that we're sticking to on our side. Uh, and that's the course that we're sticking to uh, from our side. There's some investors who, who are, or, you know, who know a certain neighborhood where they're com comfortable doing there. So, you know, we, we are uh, learning from them as well. You know, we, we get to see what are they buying it for, how much the rents are coming for, how much repairs are going into those assets and what the ROI is on those assets. Uh, and then it's a good market survey for us. Uh, and I see, and, and I think we are, we're doing better than most uh, uh, at this point, uh, unless somebody is very, you know, rehabbing and having a paint in their hand and, re, you know, with a hammer and then doing it themselves and the cost is lower. But otherwise, if you're doing it uh, institutional funding with uh, third party buying and, you know, running it like a real company, we are really ahead of the game. And, uh, you know, that's why we've been very selective of the investors we bring in at this point. It actually brings up an important point that, because uh, Tay and I are invested with you in fund two, and to be honest with you, when this whole thing happened, with it's frightening. But the one thing that helped me sleep at night, knowing that I was investing with the right partners, that will help navigate this story. Because from what I've heard and and learned is that, uh, and Dana will talk is like you could have a, a good deal with a bad operator, and they could ruin it. And then you could have a, something that happens like this, and they could you'll, you'll, you're the hero. You're going to help us weather this storm. And so that's, I feel comfortable. So think, think about that. Thanks for a great compliment, Adam, and believing in us as well. And thank you, Tay. Uh, think about one thing, that when this happened, uh, we pivoted really fast. And if there were any vacancies available, we have enough experience uh, to continue marketing it in unique ways that others may not. There were people who were afraid to go out, but we already had uh, virtual tours, Matterport, high-definition photographs, we have the marketing capabilities. We, we have a 100,000 plus database of potential clients. We reach out with social media. We were able to lease properties virtually. Remotely, we were signing leases. We were, we were doing virtual tours with people. Not every homeowner can do that. Not every, not every small company can achieve those things. We heavily invested in, in technology as we were getting into it. And then we expedited that effort while we knew we were not going to be able to function and go outside. So we had to follow the guidelines, but we were also ready to invest the money uh, because we understand the brokerage model as well. So, you know, uh, we leased more properties in the last three months than we have done in any quarter of the history of the company. Uh, so, which was, which was amazing, right? You know, you, know you, you were, people were saying there was no business and we couldn't keep up with the brokerage side as well because we were virtually remotely renting them. And that was part of the, many of the properties are part of the funds as well. So that, that ROI, and this ROI is so tight. Think about if you have 12 months of rent at $1,000. I'm just thinking random numbers. If you miss two months, that is substantial ROI reduction for the annualized return. But if you can save the return for even one month, there are people who don't rent properties because uh, once a tenant moves out, then they have to have a certain amount of time before they rent the property, there's a gap in between. But if you could start planning in advance and you save an extra one week in between because of the resources that you have, we have our repair and maintenance team ready. We have a leasing team already knows, has all the data. We have all the photographs from the past. We can do all those things in house much faster. So you save a week or two weeks. That ROI just changed. Wow. So th there's, there's enough value that, you know, having a one-stop shop brings in and you find that out when things like these happen. That exactly, and uh, I'm actually Tay and I are excited to put together a case study just to, you know, we're running numbers. It's just, just it's very interesting for us, and we're just, it's actually, it's a very interesting time. We're excited. Yeah, it's unique times, but uh, 2020 is going to be what you, what you and I make out of it. Correct. Uh, we, we, we can make it the worst year of our career, and we can make it the best year of our career. To me, this is an opportunity. Because, you know, look at Blackstone, everybody was panicking, they weren't buying, they went on a massive buying spree and started buying tens of thousands of, uh, tens of, thousands of homes. And now, you know, this is an opportunity for, for us to build wealth. Sure. The people who yeah. over leverage themselves will need to get out. 
Uh, and if they need to get out, we are right there to, to get them. Okay, I know you have some questions now. Yeah, yeah. so, hey, Gaurav, you saw, I, you said earlier that you're the, you perceive yourself kind of the rookie <laughs> among the three, of the three of you guys, right? But then, but still like uh, you've gone through multiple uh, real estate cycles. So uh, can you kind of, yeah, uh, share with us uh, kind of what was the kind of your worst deal like so far and then what did you learn from it? <laughs> I know, you, but yeah, so and then maybe is it, if there was any lesson, sure. um, I mean, what, what lesson like would you like, actually apply to running your business? Uh, I, I, one example comes to mind and it still pains me. It pains me and Ben a lot. And I think Daniel can relate to that as well at times. Uh, we actually invest, uh, we were doing a third party rehab project for somebody in the company. Uh, and uh, we just, we, we decided to take all the liability on it. Uh, we wanted to give the, you know, the best, uh, we thought it would be great by giving a one number where, a, you know, it just makes sense and it will be the best of the best uh, to have a guaranteed uh, uh, price on it uh, without actually realizing that there are more liable, more unforeseen things that may come up. Uh, and our contracts weren't tight, and we uh, and we stood behind our word for what we did, but we took a lot of liability on ourselves. Uh, all the change orders became on us. Uh, all the unforeseen things behind the walls that came on, we, we took responsibility for them as well. So we ended up taking all the risk with no reward. Uh, and we, we, but we stuck to it. You know, our integrity means means a lot to us, and we uh, we we did everything that we we're supposed to do. Uh, but we but during the process, we learned a lot of what we shouldn't be doing. You know what? You know what are the places where you protect yourself without actually hurting the owner, but uh, it's being more transparent with the owner. You know, just because you don't understand it doesn't mean you hide it by taking full liability and responsibility for it. Uh, so that I, I think that was a good lesson learned for us. Uh, you know, you, you uh, thank God it was with uh, one property, not with uh, you know. Uh, we were, you know, I would be I would be very upset if you would have made a commitment like that for a whole fund without understanding the details. So so yes, you know, so I'm glad that we actually learned it beforehand. Uh, we know where to look for things uh, in, when we're acquiring properties. We know the unforeseen. We have done enough projects now that uh, I, I think it's going to be very hard to surprise us overnight uh, of what is, you know, what is when we're buying something. Uh, but always the unforeseen, unforeseen things. But uh, we learned enough uh, at this point to uh, to not not be super surprised. We, you know, we always take risks in construction uh, and when you're buying something. So that has been my personal experience where it's a pain point. We lost a, a little bit more than I ever wanted to. Uh, and, you know, from a, from a track record, you know, that was the worst financial deal I had done. Uh, but it, it didn't, didn't break our back. It was just emotionally draining to know that we made a bad decision. Um, so, but in hindsight, thank God it was at that moment. Uh, it, made me, it made all of us better for the rest of our lives. Yeah, also, yeah, what's really important is to like learn from the mistake and never repeat the same, right? And yeah. I guess that's that's why like, you are kind of remain very poised to ensure that investors' capital is protected in such a down market like this, right? So think think about this one as well. Would you invest with somebody that keeps losing money for you or has lost money once, but it was a stupid decision? that they shouldn't have done, or if they lost money for you for things that they could have controlled. Uh, you know, but things, people lose money. So people invest in Apple and the Apple stock went down, right? So, yeah. uh, but, but they're unforeseen, unforeseen things that you can't control. Right. But if you could control something, and that mm -hmm. company should have known, could have known, could have done mm -hmm. something, didn't tell us, wasn't transparent, you'll never do business with them again. We, right, are just starting a, we are just starting our careers. Why would we do that? So we are overly protective on making sure that if we give our investors returns that we promise them or more, and not be, and if, if there was something different and it wasn't because of us or of something that happened. Listen, the new rules came out in Philadelphia about eviction laws. There's nothing I can do about it. There's absolutely nothing that we can do about it. So you know mm -hmm. that is acceptable to everybody. But if we didn't file for eviction because we just didn't understand the rules, well, that's a different story. If you didn't do lead-based paint right. because the city has different rules, well, that's a different story. You know how many people don't understand? Sorry. You know how many people don't understand all the lead-based rules uh, that the city has imposed, and now they are also talking about, uh, you know, the, the new. Uh, they talk about the eviction. They talk about the rental suitability license, the commercial activity license. 
uh, people don't understand it. And uh, if, you know, if, if I came to you and I said, I have this great property that I can buy a triplex unit and we can make this kind of return on the money and we all invest in the property and uh, a year later, you know, two of them haven't paid us rent for three months to find out I never, in, I never put, uh, I never got a rental suitability license. And when you asked me, I said, what is that? And now we can't collect the money on the three properties for six months. And now there's going to be an eviction issue. Do the ROI calculation for the next three years. You are worse than you ever started. So if you, if, so, you know, you find the right partners and knowing who, if they understand what they're doing is extremely important. You know, uh, it's just like you said, Adam, it's times like these when it, the real truth comes out. You know, uh, it's not the, 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 the upside when people are always going to be fine. It's are you going to survive in the downside? Uh, and we are very weary of it. We, we understand uh, we need to continue doing it the right way. Otherwise, long-term sustainability is going to be an issue. And we are here for long-term. We, we want to be, we, are not, we don't plan to go anywhere. It's not a buy and flip and move on. Yeah, we want to be here. And that actually brings up uh, another good point. Uh, you want to be here long term. Where do you see uh, yourselves, the company, TCS Annika Homes, and then in five years? Uh, we, we see ourselves in multiple cities. Uh, we, you know, we want to provide the best in class uh, single family work, uh, workforce housing. We also see our tenants now relating to our properties as a community. Uh, we have to combine them and bring them together where there is a brand where they relate to. Uh, you know, buying or renting uh, or investing or renting in from a brand of, from, from us uh, should be more of a comfort and a referral source than us going out and marketing it. So we want to build that kind of a product, uh, just like a multifamily community would be. I think this can be achieved in a single family as well. Uh, if they know that the leaders and the owners and the product is going to be standard, I think there's going to be a lot more economies of scale happening where, oh, that property is with TC Sonica Homes we know what to expect from it. So I can actually rent it by going to Baltimore. I would rather rent it from them because of renting here. I'm okay renting it there as well because I can expect the product to be the same and the experience to be the same. So that's what our vision is in the future. It shouldn't be one, one off here and there. Uh, you know, there should be consistency and there should be a, a brand that follows the product. Uh, so that's our vision. Uh, you know, we want people living in the communities for longer. We want people living in, when I say communities, it's single family, but it's within our group of properties. You know, uh, so we, we, we think of all those as families within our communities of single family properties that we have. So that's our plan. That's our vision. Uh, let's see uh, how fast we get there. Uh, we will get there. It's a matter of how fast we get there. No, we want to ride the wave with you. We want to, we want to ask and just keep on. Yeah, yeah. And we need you as well. We 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 love uh, working with partners like yourself. Uh, you know, you bring great value. Uh, but think from yourself as well. What you did was, you know, we we're talking about leveraging. That's exactly what you did. You leveraged mm -hmm. with the relationship with Daniel. You leveraged with the opportunities that TC Sonic Homes bring in. You leveraged with your other relationships of having the smaller investment portfolio groups to bring it one large portfolio of one investment. So you leveraged in many level levels that others didn't. So kudos to you guys for creating that unique opportunity. Appreciate it. That means a lot to me. And it's, you know, that, that's exactly it. It's all about relationships in this business. And, you know, I just feel very excited and, and thankful that I have the relationship with you, with, with you guys, uh, Garv and, and, and Daniel and Ben. And I know uh, Ben's the next interview I'm going to have to set up. Yeah, Ben is awesome. <laughs> he's, 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 a, he's a much better speaker than I am. Yeah, I'm not the best speaker yet. Um, I'm probably going to look at this a few months from now, I'm like, oh, I hate it, you know, mess up. I need mean, to. I, sh I should never watch my own interviews. I, I probably blabber more and repeat the same things. No, you're very articulate and can get straight to the point. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll get it. Uh, so yeah. This, this, it, does, it, doesn't, it doesn't change who I am. I am who I am. I know what I believe in. Uh, I, I want to leave a legacy behind. I want people to know me for what we have done. Uh, but I always... Uh, you know, my, uh, my dad has always told me, uh, if you left the room and somebody said, do you know the guy? And the guy and the other people in the room say, yes, you should know him. Well, that's success. Then you achieve success. So, you know, I, I want to achieve that level where I don't walk out of the room and somebody says, do you know this guy? And they just watch out. You know, that no money can, can, can actually compensate for that kind of a, 
uh, that are of reputation. I, I don't want to be that person. I, uh, uh, I, I come from humble beginnings and I'm very proud to where, be where I am and I want to continue the right things. And I think anybody that you know, uh, is looking to have to do business with us or invest with us uh, also needs to know that you know, uh, it's, it's, our, it's our background. It's, our, it's who we are. Is what we believe in. Uh, how long we want to stay in this business? Where, how, how long we've been in business? Is a third generation with Ben? Is a second generation with Daniel? Uh, you know, it's my integrity and hard work that I've gotten here, us, me here as well. Uh, I think it's 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 the people you invest in. Uh, you, you know, even even with the companies, with the larger uh, Fortune 500 companies, when the CEO is changed, the stock value changes. It's when the CEO leaves, the stock value changes because it's the vision and the person at the top that triggers the trickles the uh, the, the culture and the, and the vision in the future, I think it's always, we always invest without knowing or knowing, we always invest our president, you know, either side you believe in, you're going to be investing in a person. Uh, and that is going to be the future that you believe in. So, you know, we always invest in people. So we, we, we hope people get to know us. Uh, we're more than happy to, you know, talk more about who we are, what we have done. And uh, we want to be, in, you want to be as scrutinizing them as much as they're scrutinizing us. Uh, to have the right partnership because this has to be long term. We, we, there's more energy is wasted in between uh, with not having the right partner at, at both levels. It makes perfect sense. Um, Tay, I think you want to you want to ask some personal questions. Personal questions? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I mean, I mean, just, I, I don't have like really personal question, but I'm just wanted to make a statement that. I'm very like uh, really uh, inspired by the philosophy you actually like share with us. I mean, you have a very uh, great integrity, and then you actually does try to like, set a, a good example and then leave a legacy. That actually like uh, tells a lot of uh, 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 principles. I mean, that that's really, really like underlying the business we are running. So yeah, I, I really like uh, it's a great opportunity for you, for me to like get to know you better, and not only that, and also. Uh, your uh, underlying fundamental principle. I mean, that I I can't agree more more with you on the importance of investing in people. Yeah, all at the end of the day, it really boils down to the people you interact with and do the business with, and uh, kind of we pull each other up and then uh, grow together. So, yeah, I'm one percent on the same page with you uh, about that philosophy in particular. So, yeah, appreciate uh, sharing your uh, uh, philosophy. Yeah. Absolutely. So, for the like, what tips do you recommend for entrepreneurs like for, to achieve your your high level of, of of success? Like routines, habits. Like, what do you study? So, uh, uh, interestingly, I I didn't read much uh, throughout my career. I started reading now. Uh, since I came to KW, I think I, I got a lot of good coaching from people that reminded me what uh, uh, reading can do and help you. And uh, it has now started making, and I see why, which I would, what was reading much more before I haven't. Uh, and and habits-wise, I, uh, I, I'm going through a big personal change in my uh, life as well. I think I think uh, last 10 years or 15 years have been pure, just work and career, work and career. And, uh, uh, but now the, you know, what now, I hope the new entrepreneur, I hope, not the new entrepreneur, I hope the younger generation realizes what I'm realizing now, uh, that routines are important, habits are better, uh, you know, done much earlier in life. Uh, so yeah, so now uh, uh, I spend more time with my family. I am uh, taking more better of a work-life balance uh, on the weekends or in the evenings as much as I can. Um, you know, I, I focus more on my health at this point. I, you know, I eat better. Uh, I'm reading more. I'm traveling more. So uh, uh, what I would, what I tell the, what I tell the, uh, uh, and anybody who, uh, if there's one piece of advice I can tell anybody uh, from my, from my experience in my career is, uh, your reputation will follow, follow you forever. Uh, don't think that people are not looking at you, and oh, they will never find out, or you can cheat somebody, or uh, this is you can, I can justify this by making a reasoning later. It will always catch up. Uh, people see through the through the lies very easily. People will find out uh, if they haven't found out today. So don't do anything. If it feels wrong in your gut, it's probably wrong. Don't try to overdo your gut feeling. Uh, and if it feels like it's not right, 
stay away from it. Even if you think that you're doubting yourself, you're probably, you're probably right. Uh, it's not worth the risk. So uh, thank God that I, I have, uh, Ben and I have grown together a lot. My previous business partner in uh, Mega Realty, same kind of guy, man of integrity. I've been surrounding myself with, fortunately with good people. They never uh, made me go outside the line. Uh, you know, just not be, you know, you always stay within your, your, your legal rights. You always stay within your ethical line on the other side. You don't put your, you don't dabble just one step to see how it feels and how far you can go away with it. Uh, that's a mistake I think a lot of people make and one bad experience uh, travels like wildfire. Uh, and I've seen people just ruin their businesses, uh, ruin their reputation uh, because of that. You know, and, and it's just such a small city. We're the fifth largest city, but a city of neighborhoods. So, uh, you, you know, just continue doing the right thing. Uh, it's a matter of time. Uh, it don't, there's no shortcut to hard work. I still probably work 12, 15 hours at times. There's no shortcut to hard work. You gotta, and the people that are around you respect you as well once they see you that you are putting in that effort. So they, they want to be are next to you because you're fighting with them. You're not fighting by sitting on a couch and saying, yeah, you go ahead and do it. You know, I, you're fighting with them. So I think that's a, that's a level of respect that you earn from your team when you're standing next to them. And uh, that's how I think I've done it. Simple philosophy, simple formula, nothing, nothing rocket science. Just do it right every single time. You don't have to remember any lies. Just say it the right way. It's such a simple process. That was good. Uh, thank you. That was uh, great. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Cool. I'm, I'm that, that, that's uh, actually like a sage advice and yeah, life lessons. Yeah. Yeah. You, you look back and people ask you, you know, what have you done right? What I, I, say, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I've done anything intentionally right. But here's the things that I've always focused on. So not necessarily that mm -hmm. I've said, hey, you know, I can, I can do something, but I shouldn't be doing wrong. It's like, just do the right thing. Is it right or wrong? You always have a choice, right? If you, if you take your life, right. you, you can probably go down uh, in, in two lines. Yes or no? That's all there is. There's no maybe, there's no if, but there's no, it's literally black and white as in yes or no. Should I do this interview with you guys? Yes or no? There's no maybe, if, nothing. It's yes or no. Uh, and, you know, do we end at 318? Do we end at 321? We have a choice. Yes or no? You know, are you going to publish this? Yes or no? Are you going to talk to somebody else? Yes or no? Are you going to invest? Yes or no? Uh, are, are you going to be friends? Yes or no? Are you going to be a partner? Yes or no? Do I call him back? Yes or no? Everything is yes or no. It's whatever you do, you can actually have this path of, I said, yes, I went here. And I said, yes or no, I did this. I said, yes or no, I went this. I'll take a flight. Yes or no, I'll travel. Yes or no. It, you know, there's no ifs and buts. It's yes or no. So every single time, just make the decision based on your integrity. Am I doing this right? Yes or no. So that, that you'll never, ever have to look back. And then sometimes you make a wrong mistake, right? You say, if I would have not done that, my life would have been different because it was a question of yes or no. Wow. And that taught me. I respect him a lot. That, that's amazing. So uh, what, what type of, um, like, what is your routine like? You, you know, five days a week, you wake up, you work out, you, like, just- so I, I, work, I work out four days a week. I'm, I'm, I'm usually, my daughter wakes me up at seven o'clock every morning, uh, irrespective, Saturday or Sunday or Monday. Uh, we, we, uh, and uh, you know, I, I try to go to work every day uh, uh, for the same amount of time. Even when it was during COVID, it was, you know, at least nine to six. Uh, that's a schedule that I've always had. Uh, then you try to spend some family time. Uh, sometimes it overpowers your work, overpowers your personal time after six, and there's a challenge, uh, especially during COVID. There was no end to, time, end to working because there were so many things happening. But usually it's a uh, wake up at seven, uh, drop the daughter to school, uh, Nine to six is work time. Get home by seven. Spend some family time. By nine thirty ten, catch up on your some know, some of the emails. Respond back by eleven ish. Go to bed and start the day again. And then weekends, uh, you know, there's uh, there, there's no complete disconnect. You know, uh, entrepreneurs and business owners can't say I shut down. Uh, you know, you're working when your eyes open and you're working when your eyes close. In between, if you don't do that, then you you have a job. I don't have a job. You know, I am, I am the business, uh, I, you know, uh, I'm supporting the business. So routine is uh, very simple and straightforward. Uh, whatever happens in between during the day, uh, time management is always an issue. Uh, 
you know, uh, Gary Keller in one of his uh, classes that uh, masterminds that I am with him, uh, he said, he says, you, you know, you, you'll never have a work-life balance. It's always steps. It's never this. It's, if you have the steps, you can make it a linear line in between, but you may focus on something, which is work, and your family suffers. Then you're going to focus on family, and then your work suffers. Then you grow with your work, your family suffers. Then you grow on your... He said, you always like, try to balance it, but you'll always go in the, one of the other directions. And I thought it was pretty cool, actually. And it's so true. We always do that, right? You know, we'll say, you know, I'm going to focus on my health. And then it goes two months. And then it's like, oh, by the way, I stopped traveling. So I'm going to go for one week vacation. Oh, by the way, I went on a vacation. I ate too much. What happened to my gym? Oh, now I'm going to go back to the gym more. It's always uh, trying an art of balancing. So uh, keep, keep to a routine. Be consistent uh, as much as you can. Uh, that, I think that's uh, that, that's a... Uh, key to consistency is a key to success you just don't just, you can't you can't stop uh, is it health is it career is it work is it relationship building is it prospecting is it creative ideas it's masterminding it's uh you just can't stop uh there are seven billion people you're competing with uh it's it's if everybody could do it then how are you different you know it, it's it's painful uh if, if it was for, so easy everybody would be doing it isn't it what sets us apart. Yeah. There only, there's only 7 billion people to compete with. Wow. That's, that's a lot uh, right there because I'm, I read books and wake up at like five in the morning, four, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out like my schedule. I tried the fives, the fours, I'm trying to still figure it out. But I like. There are those two o'clock, three o'clock nights as well. Happens a lot. Uh, but that's not really the routine. There's, there's exceptions where, you know, you have to make, you know, have to read some documents, present some things, uh, you know, you're traveling, then you squeeze all your meetings in one day, uh, things like that will always happen. Uh, but uh, I, I think I can still uh, compete with anybody who says they work more hours than me, or they work harder than me. I, I'm going to give them a tough competition. Uh, I'm, uh, one, one thing that I do pride myself is uh, the work ethic. Uh, I think, I think that has been my biggest asset. Uh, I, I am consistent. I'm always, I think my team, we can see the same thing. I am always consistent with work. You, 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 you send me a message, there's no 24 hours. I'm connected. I'll find time. And, you know, I just tell my wife as well, you know, on Saturday from 12 to 2 p.m., I need two hours to catch up with work. Uh, uh, you know, so I, I need two, two hours. If I set the expectation, we, we schedule around us. Unless we are going out and then it's okay. You know, but if I'm home or if you're around, I need some time to catch up. Uh, you know, Saturday and Sunday is just two more days of the week. You know, it just you can't be completely be cut off. It doesn't work, especially when you're leading people. You can't be cut off. Uh, that's the worst thing people do: no communication. In, in this in this day and age, the the uh, sense of instant gratification is so high that if you don't respond, uh, then you know somebody else. But you have to have a balance. But the expectation is you can't be off for three days. You have to be connected, especially if it's not on vacation, you're working. Saturday Sunday doesn't give you the right of uh, completely disconnecting. There are transactions happening. There is business happening. There is rain and, you know, hail. And uh, it's, people just say, I, I, don't, I don't work on the weekends. Well, that's always surprises me. That, yeah, I agree, I agree with you. It, it, it doesn't stop. There's always something. Like, I'm going to Aruba on Saturday. And I would like to think I want to enjoy a vacation, but I know we live in a, in a day and age where you have a phone, you have internet. So you can enjoy, but you can say, and you can plan your day and say, this for 30 minutes from 12 to 30, I'm going to have this. At that moment, your wife will schedule herself to go to the spa. And then you can sit on the beach and you can, you know, do that. So you, can, you have to manage everybody around you as well. So that's the art of negotiating and time management. You know, setting the right expectation, but also feeling other people's emotions, you know, making sure that they're happy and or finding out what they're doing. That's a, you know, planning that you have to do. That's again, part of time management. I need to know around people what they are doing and when can I squeeze in myself at what places, what I like to do, what I don't have to do, what is not needed of me to do. I only have 24 hours and so do you. You don't have 25 hours, unfortunately, neither do I. So we both have to do the same thing, what we want to do in 24 hours. How do we achieve both of us? You know, how does the president of the country has more time? How does the, uh, 
the CEO of a large company who has 180,000 agents. How does Gary Keller have 180,000 agents? And when I text him, he responds back to me in less than 24 hours. How, how does he do it? It's time well, management. Time management. That's yeah. Well, yeah. thank, thank you so much for taking your time. I know we spent so much time, and <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the time we've been on here for some. For, for no, this is a good conversation, and I and I'm I'm known to be talking a lot, so I need to. Stop. Oh, this is great. I definitely want to like have another like meeting with you and and learn more. Um, this is hey, like you know, this is just amazing. I'm just taking it all in. It's it's really nice. Oh, I appreciate you saying good things. But, uh, yeah, I can thanks. also tell you that yeah, our interview is. Oh, sorry. I think we lost him. I, I just wanted to say, like, uh, I have to tell you the, we are here to actually the, talk about the real estate for the most part. But the, I feel like I took some very great life lesson course, and I got so many like uh, great like uh, advice, life advice from you. And then I definitely need to like replay this video, and then I like to really. Uh, I mean, acquire some of your lessons you actually the share with us and then really try to apply them to my life because uh, it re uh, many of your uh, like, uh, advice really like uh, resonated with me. Yeah, while I was listening to you. So, oh man, this is so good. I mean, I like to really soak it in deeply and then I like to, it definitely will be help me become a better person for sure, a better version of myself down the road. Yeah, so thank you so much for your time and then Providing us with a uh, yeah, great uh, life lesson. So I appreciate truly, it. Truly, truly appreciate it. My yeah. wife's gonna watch this too because yeah. that's the biggest problem. I'm trying to like, I have a wife, I have family, friends, and I'm like, it, there's so much going on, and 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 exactly like, how do you manage everything? And you know, and that was well said. Like, it never stops. You, you gotta set time for like. Uh, and one of the last thing that we leave. Uh, one of the books I read. Uh, it said. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it was the shift book with Gary. We were just doing a book club. We started reading more books. Uh, it says, what do you do when you go for a three hour movie? If a phone call comes in, you're probably gonna mute it or just say, can I call you back? Uh, that's probably going to be true. Uh, and I know myself, I'll do that. And they said, can you be on a three hour movie every day? And then figure out how much time you wanna spend with your family or do something else or do prospecting or do interviews, like one and a half hour we're talking, I don't know who texted me and who called me. I'm just focused here and so are you. So we actually agree to spend our time and dedicate ourselves for things that we want to do. But then other times we always will say there's a distraction because we allow the distraction to come into our lives. Right now, all three of us are not allowing any other distraction to interrupt us. It's on us, not them. So it's, it's something, you know, that, that I've been now trying to do is like, you know, okay, so it's only two hours in the evening when I won't be, could I not check the phone or could I check the phone and only manage the calls or interruptions that I would allow them to interrupt me. Most of the other ones, I'll call you back. I'm in a movie. It's a simple answer. I'm in a movie right now. I can't be bothered because I'm watching a movie. So uh, small life things that stick to your mind. That was, a lot, that was a very new one that I started implementing in my life. I'm in a movie right now. <laughs> well, the, there we have it. We have one and only, or Garab Gambino. Thank you so much for, for this amazing interview. And just, you know, thank you, Tay, for joining. And uh, you know, thank, you thank you, both of you. Great. Thank you, both of you. Good luck. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Garab. Yeah. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Take care.